And without further ado, I mean, we so look forward to it every time we get a chance. And I know he's one of the busiest guys. And, you know, he went from retirement. Then he went to, like, getting back into it. And it's, it's kind of like the Godfather scene where the guy goes, just when you thought I was out, they pull me back in. And here's Mike Golick. I mean, Mike, you're back in it again, and you're you're rolling around. And how do you feel? I thought you were going to go into retirement, but there they are pulling you back in. Yeah, well, I mean, calling games is so much fun, and I do that for Westwood One, the national uh, radio uh, gig. Um, I do the Sunday night games. So going to the stadium, being around the players, and, and really being around the coaches who are more my age uh, <laughs> is uh, kind of kind of keeps me in the game. But I didn't think I'd go back to a daily show, but I'm doing it with my kid. So, I mean, if it wasn't with my kid, I, I don't think I'd be doing a daily show. I, I can't. I finished my uh, last three years at ESPN doing the show with my son, Mike, and Trey Wingo, and and, you know, I had the opportunity to do it again here. So I, I, I had to do that. Plus, my wife would have got really mad at me if I didn't. <laughs> That's the only reason I do it, too. I'm not <laughs> underneath my wife's feet. So she says, get away, go do <laughs> something to get away from us here. Hey, Mike, before I talk to you about the Eagles, I got to ask you about, because I'm going to throw this at you here. Watch this. So a real tough guy, guy that's a little snarky. He's got an attitude. He's really kind of a little edgy guy. Mike, did the Cleveland Browns, do you think they regretted allowing Baker Mayfield to go? And do you think they overreacted by not trying to develop the kid more? And if again, I know it's hindsight. I know it's Monday morning quarterback stuff. But, Mike, I mean, really, isn't Baker Mayfield Cleveland? The attitude, uh, the whole thing like that is isn't he Cleveland? I mean, I mean, he is, but but you got to remember there were so many changes in Cleveland that to develop a player, you need kind of a steady crew. And they didn't have a steady crew. And you know, you look at his time in Cleveland, his last couple of years, you know, a little over 60% uh completion. 17 touchdowns, 13 interceptions. He only had one year at Cleveland where he had single-digit interceptions. That was in 2020. But I, listen, I love his attitude, but I don't think the Cleveland situation was a stable situation to develop a stable quarterback. Had they been a more stable situation, maybe they would have uh, kept Baker. But they have their own issues as far as stability uh, and the coaching staff. So I think that's one of the reasons they just figured they would they would start anew. Do you think that's what's happened here with Baker and Tampa that, you know, you've got, you know, Jason Light, you got Bruce Arians still in the building. I, 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 I love Todd Bowles, okay? I really do. I thought he did a great job second half of the season last year, Mike, by rallying the troops because they got out to a bumpy start. They really had a nice playoff game against the Birds. I mean, but do you think that's why you're seeing a turn turnaround here? He had 147 quarterback rating, four touchdowns. I mean, he threw for 4,100 yards a year ago. What's been the difference with him in Tampa? You know, I, I think it's a lot of times it's an attitude um, change, an attitude shift. They didn't want him in Cleveland. The writing was kind of on the wall in Cleveland. They weren't building around him in Cleveland. They were looking to replace him in Cleveland. Uh, he went to, he went to what, Carolina? Uh, but then he went to the Rams and he showed out, signed on a Thursday and showed out in that game. But you knew that wasn't going to be his job. It was Matthew Stafford's job. So he had to find a go to a place where it was going to be his job. And that turned out to be Tampa uh, after Tom left. And kind of a, you know, grass was greener type of a situation. Grass isn't always greener, but he was able to show out. And you know he's a leader. You know players love him. They, they, they love to follow him, but you also need really good play out of your quarterback. And he was inconsistent at times, uh, but very good at times. Don't get me wrong. Um, but he got consistent in Tampa Bay uh, with the talent there. And they believed in him. They were saying, it's, it's your team. And he only had that for a, a, a short while in Cleveland before they were kind of looking for a replacement or weren't sure if he was the guy or kind of wait, a wait-and-see approach. In Tampa, they were going to give him that opportunity. Mike, let me take you to the birds here. I'm going to throw a number at you here. In the last 18 games, Jalen Hurts has 23 turnovers. 
He had three more in that game against uh, Green Bay. Um, you can tell um, that motion helped him a lot. When he didn't have motion, he struggled again throwing across the middle of the field. Right. And now, look, it's a completely different offense from that RPO in 22 to yeah. what they're trying to get him right now. Um, just your takeaways, and I don't mean to load the question up on you here, but do you look at Philly as being a Super Bowl contending type team? Yeah, I do. I I, I think San Francisco is. I think uh, Detroit is. I thought Dallas would have a down year, but hearing you talk right before I came on, you're not, you're not going to go off for one week, though they looked better than I yep. thought, and Cleveland looked worse than I thought. Now, Cleveland's got quarterback issues, uh, quite honestly. Um, and I, I so I'll wait and see on Dallas, but they certainly played better than I thought uh, they were going to play. Uh, but Philly, yeah. I mean, but turnovers kill you. You know that. You know that they had to square away their defense. They didn't invest in the linebacking crew last year. And then they dealt with injuries in the linebacking crew in the secondary. So they had to kind of rebuild there again, change coordinators again, had the old timer and Vic Fangio running the show. Now um, the offense, they have weapons. They still have a hell of an old line, even though Cam Jurgens took over for Jason Kelsey. He's not Jason Kelsey, but he's been there. He's been getting reps. Uh, they have weapons in Saquon. I thought Saquon was one of the best guys that switched teams, and he certainly proved it. You just can't you can't turn the ball over. You can't, you know, Bill Belichick, you know, and it's not Bill Belichick didn't invent it, but he'd say it the most. It's not that you win a game, it's the other team makes mistakes. And turnovers are mistakes. Turnovers are giving another team more uh, possessions. You know, in that Green Bay game, they get more – This was and, and, and it was a close game. Even though it was a high-scoring game, I believe, if I remember, it was never more than one score. Yeah. Nobody right. built a lead-up. It was so it was, it was a back-and-forth game. So that that's when that's when turnovers can kill you. And that's got to end. That has to end because the talent is there, especially offensively. The talent is there. How about this too, Mike? I mean, you know, you, you, you move forward with that team. You got Barkley with 24 carries. Now, obviously, he's not going to carry the ball 400 times. The most he's ever had was, I think, a, two years ago where he had 295. And you're talking about a guy with two injuries in the last four years on his wheels. And then you got Jalen Hurts, who had 13 carries. He's on pace for over 220. And you want to try to get away from that. They won that football game, Mike, not because of the passing game. They won that because of the run game. Can you sustain the workload? with your quarterback and your running back like that going forward here because that offense is brand new. You're developing a passing game. You're trying to get him to be a progressive reading quarterback. Can you sustain that with Barkley, who's been injured the last couple of years? Um, 24 carries, no. Uh, but you also look at, a, at an older back who went to Baltimore and Derrick Henry's pushing 30, right? Yep. But for the last five mm -hmm. years, Derrick Henry led the league in touches, carries, and, and, and receptions. And he only had 13 carries in the, in Baltimore's first game against Kansas City. And I'd say the same thing about Lamar Jackson. Lamar Jackson can't sustain 16 carries. Now, they weren't all planned runs, just like Jalen's weren't all planned runs. They was, they were scrambling. Jaden Daniels for Washington had 16 carries. You, you, it's difficult to sustain that, but you need that to win. So it's kind of a damned if you do, damned if you don't. I remember after... Um, Josh Allen's rookie year in Buffalo, his second year, they were like, we can't have him run this much. And he didn't run as much and they were struggling. And then it was like, all right, Josh, go be Josh. And Josh was going to run and Josh was going to run over people. And Josh was going to, going to carry the ball. And game one, Josh has two passing touchdowns, two rushing touchdowns, hurts his hand, diving into the end zone. You have to, if they're going to win the Super Bowl, if Baltimore is going to win the Super Bowl, if Bills are going to win the Super Bowl, if the Eagles are going to win the Super Bowl, their quarterbacks are going to have to run the ball and they're going to have to risk bodily injury because that's the way the offense runs. They're, they're too dangerous to doing it to not do it. Now, you would hope that you could get away with some games where they're rushing the ball in single digits, <laughs> but they for them to be at their best, those quarterbacks have to be threats. Mike, are you taking the field or are you taking the three-peat Chiefs? Uh, I'm actually taking uh, – I, I made my, my, my Super Bowl picks. I have the Chiefs going for their third straight in the Super Bowl, and I have them losing to Detroit, actually. I, I have Detroit winning it. 
Yeah. I think Detroit. Why Detroit? Why do you have Detroit winning it? I just, you know, their offense. Uh, I, I, I like Ben Johnson. Didn't, didn't take a head coaching job. He went back to that offense. That offense has been rolling up uh, with the yards defensively. They re. I just called their their game for us. Would won the Rams and the Detroit. Nothing like the first Sunday night game going to overtime. What an excellent game that was. They they rebuilt uh, the secondary. Uh, they had the same linebackers. They got DJ Reader, who didn't play in the first game because of quad, but he'll play to help stop the run. Uh, Marcus Davenport to try and take pressure off Aiden Hutchinson. I just think they built the right way in all the right areas, uh, and they were close last year to being in the Super Bowl. Uh, so I, I just think they're ready to take the next step. Mike, couple questions, a couple more for you here. Um, Brock Purdy. You know, I'm waiting for this guy to turn into a pumpkin, and yeah. I just, you know, hey. You know, I, I think he I think he suffers from these two things. Seventh round pick, and I can't I can't get away from Jimmy Garoppolo because I saw Garoppolo pretty much do the same thing. Now, is he more effective? Is he more efficient? He surely looks like he knows what he's doing. And I think the difference when I watch him, Mike, compared to like Jalen Hurts, Jalen struggles across the middle of the field. These Kyle Shanahan quarterbacks threaten the middle of the field. They're not afraid to threaten the seam, and they're not afraid to threaten the hash marks. They're just – and that's Kyle Shanahan. Um, the 49ers, second-best team in the league right now? Uh, yeah. Oh, I would say so. Yeah, you, I think you have to give them that. And they do threaten the middle of the field. They love the middle of the field. And for the last at least Kyle Shanahan years, they lead the league in yards after catch. So they don't always have to go deep. They go short routes – whether it's CMC out of the backfield or slant routes or short routes, bubble screens, whatever, and they get yards after the catch. And they have multiple weapons. Listen, a lot of people keep saying that, well, Brock Purdy's got all the weapons. Brock Purdy's always going to be, you know, an undrafted or or, or a seventh-round pick. But Dak Prescott wasn't a first-rounder, right. and he's now the highest-paid quarterback in the league, <laughs> right? And he had, he had talent around him. Brock's got a lot of talent around him, and Brock is incredibly efficient. It seems like Brock is never going to get the kudos that he should because I don't know if he's ever going to throw, you know, for for a ton of yards. And and everybody's always going to say, well, he's got Debo, he's got Ayuk, he's got Kittle, he's got Christian McCaffrey, uh, that he has all the weapons. So it's all set up for him in that Kyle Shanahan offense. But someone's still got to pull the trigger. And he's doing a job and he's going to get paid. He is going to get paid. They're, they're, they're going to be in the – they've been able to get away with it <clears throat> on a rookie uh, pay scale, and that's going to end after next season. I'll tell you what, Mike. My kudos will be when I make 60. I don't need anybody to pat me on the back. Ah. Just give me the 60, and I'm good with – hey, you can, you can kiss everyone else's rear end here, but uh, just give me the 60. Let me take you to New York, Mike. Um you know, I watched Aaron Rodgers. You know, one of the things that I thought that made him special, just like with Steve Young, and you noticed chasing Young around, was that when Young got loose in the perimeter, he was almost undefensible. And that kind of was like Aaron Rodgers' game when he was more mobile. And when he was a spot quarterback on, Sun, or on Monday against the Niners, I think the rust was there. But again, I did not see a mobile guy, and he looked different. Do I want to say a little better version than Kirk Cousins? Kind of, but I'm not going to put him in that category. He's a great player. Are you concerned about the Jets and his mobility? Because that was a major part of his game. So he was Patrick Mahomes before Patrick Mahomes yeah. got to the league. Now, Absolutely. Pat Patrick was a little more of a magician on the run, but, but Aaron rolling left, rolling right, his accuracy is ridiculous anyway. But he could buy time, and he always bought time to throw the ball. He didn't buy time and then try and run. Occasionally he would run. But he bought time to throw the ball, and he was freaking dangerous. And that, that you know, it, it's kind of like when age or injury takes it away. Like Tom Brady was never that. Tom Brady was a pocket quarterback. Peyton Manning was a pocket quarterback. If the pocket collapsed, they both threw the ball away and lived to play another day. So the only thing that was going to stop them was – their arm getting – because and neither one of them had the strongest arm in the world. Yeah, right. So you could last a longer time playing that way because you weren't relying on your legs or just the incredible arm strength that would get taken away over time. 
Well, injury has has at least again. We'll go back to what you said before I came on. Let's give it more than a game. Let's see if he he builds back up to be able to move. You know, he's knocking off some rust. Um, just but but it was different. He he kind of kept the Clark Kent suit on. Yeah, right. Yeah. And thrown from the pocket and and wasn't able to escape and do the things you normally do. Will he? Time will tell. If you're the New York Giants and Joe Schoen and you're Brian Dable, boy, I tell you, the, the hard knocks, they did everything in their power to get rid of Daniel Jones or yep. move up to get to number three to try to get Drake May at least or maybe even Jaden Daniels. They allowed Barkley <clears throat> – to walk out of the room with no compensation, Mike. I mean, nothing. And you saw him see him get three TDs. I'm good friends with John Mara. Had him on my program. Liked the guy a lot. Know him through my uncle and all that. But I got to tell you, Tish and John Mara cannot be happy right now. And are they ready, in your opinion, to start Drew Locke pretty soon? Are we looking at the Drew Locke era coming around the corner? Do you think they'll run through the tape with Daniel Jones? I, I I think Daniel Jones is going to be on his last leg in New York. I mean that that yeah that hard knocks off season was was somewhat eye opening. And listen, it's not like Barkley would have changed their fortune. They just don't have enough talent. Yep. But but again, paying a running back, you're you're the running backs are the outside of the kickers are the lowest cap hit you're going to have on your team compared to other positions out there. But they just they just wouldn't pay him. They went and and. and this is where you get in trouble when you have a a mid a quarterback who started out looking good and then got injured, was average, where you have a mid quarterback and you had to make that decision to pay him or not. Because if you didn't pay him, then you had to start over. And you paid him and he got hurt and you're not getting the production, so then you really think about starting over, but that that cap number just kind of hangs there and burdens you. That's that's the trouble. You either have a quarterback, a high pick who's bad that you know you're going to get rid of, or one who's really good and you're gonna you're gonna re-sign him and it's a no-brainer. Or you get, or it's kind of like a team like Minnesota did with Kirk Cousins, always finish in the middle of the pack. Never got a high draft pick, never got a low draft pick, got a mid draft pick. They were a mid team. Now, Giants are a bad team with a with a bad to mid quarterback. Absolutely. Finally. Mike, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put this in a box here instead of just because I don't, I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to crush you here with the NIU loss, but I do want to <laughs> ask you this about about Notre Dame. Is Notre Dame in the modern times of college football yet? But what I mean by that is, there used to be a time, and because you guys had, I think it was called Prop Forty Eight. Yeah. When you won the national title in '88, right. you were bringing guys in. And you were giving guys opportunity to get educated, to get graduate, but yep. you were also bringing players in like Alabama did. Right. And that was a different time under Coach Holtz. That thing went away. And if I'm not mistaken, this may have been during your time. I don't know if they do it now, but they didn't really believe in redshirting. Right. Players back in the day. Now I saw that there were some transfers, the quarterback from Duke. So they're utilizing yep. that. I don't know where they are in nil. Marcus Freeman now, I mean – it looks to me like Notre Dame is still in the tradition of being Notre Dame, and they want to keep that integrity. Somebody asked me why they're not in a conference. I go, Notre Dame's not going to go around touting that they're the third best team in the SEC. That's not who Notre Dame is. They're not going to go, hey, we're the third team in the Western side. That's one of the reasons they stay independent along with that NBC deal. So, again, back to the question, do you think – they're in the modern times because this is one of the reasons Nick Saban left the game too, was he didn't want to pay with nil. He didn't want to be involved in that. How do you feel about Notre Dame right now? Yeah, they're, they're, they're paying NIL and they're bringing it, they're bringing in the, the transfer portal. Um, but, but they, they don't, they don't do the prop 48 anymore. So, so what happens is you get teams who you get kind of the graph where it goes high and then it goes it goes top 20, top eight, yeah. top five. You know, when my, my boys were here, they played the national championship game in 2013. Brian Kelly also went to the playoffs a couple of times. And before everybody who's listening comments, well, they went to the playoff and they got smoked. Everybody do your homework and don't just funnel in on Notre Dame. 
Look at the semifinal games from just about every, all the uh, BCS area era. All the teams that lost got smoked, not just Notre Dame. They got hammered in the semifinals and some in the finals. So it wasn't just Notre Dame. So Notre Dame, and, and I think that's why Brian Kelly left, because all that was missing from his resume was a national championship. And he felt he had a better chance year in and year out to get players to hang out near the top to have a chance at a national championship where Notre Dame kind of went up that way and had a chance, but then was in the top 15, then was in the top six, then was in the top 20, then was in the top five. And so, so it was kind of a, kind of an up and down graph uh, to where, to where they can be um, and where they can end up. And listen, being independent, listen, it's about money. I mean, it's about money. They can make as much money or more and be independent, not be in a conference. Sure, they they would never get a, a top four seed. They'd have to be a number five, but they're fine with that, and I'm fine with that. And now, and, and it was always about the money, and it was about ease of getting into college playoffs. And now that there's 12 teams, it's easier to get in. Though after a loss to Northern Illinois, we'll see. Um, and and listen, I have no problem talking about that. Northern Illinois deserved that win. They outplayed Notre Dame in Notre Dame. And as Marcus said, he said, maybe everybody was just feeling a little too good about themselves after the Texas A&M win, and they got knocked down for it. And you you, you, bet, you best learn from it. And I thought they would just pull that game out by a point or by four points and just get out with the win like other top teams did against smaller teams in week two. They had just closer wins, but they got out of it. Notre Dame didn't. Now they put themselves in, in a bit of a hole to, to basically have to run the table. Well, I, I, I want to follow up on that one thing you said, though. Mike, I always – I mean, University of Miami, where I went, has a 19% admittance rate, and yet, you know, that really doesn't apply to the football team. They want right. somebody. They're getting it. Yeah. Or look at look at Alabama. Alabama's got an 81% admittance rate. That means that was set up, in my opinion, for the sports programs to get whoever they want. Right. They recruit 20 people. They're getting 20 people. You're kind of in the room with Stanford a little bit. Yep. Mike, if you recruit 20 guys, Marcus is probably going to get six of those guys yep. to get through. That's got to make it even more impossible oh, yeah. for them to be able to win a national title. It does. It does. But they're but they're going to stand by that. They're going to stand by that and 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 try and build a national championship. Like I said, be close, then be down a little bit, then be close. That's not going to change. By the way, your your Miami team. They have done a nice job recruiting high school. They've done a nice job in the portal. And Cam Ward is boy, he's he's fun to watch. They are uh, they they are a team to watch this year. Miami uh, went out. Mario was on the show all the time, and um, you know we talked about it. You know they went out. One thing that he really did, you know, he recruited that kid Penay Sewell, who's up in Detroit, right? And he really has done a nice job with the re- offensive line. They've re- they they brought an attitude back. They went into Florida and pasted oh. them. Jeez. I mean, that, and by the way, that's the worst I've seen a Florida Gator football team look in a long time in Billy Napier. And I don't know if he survives that that thing. I mean, Napier and Cristobal went in at the same time to Miami and Florida, and they both in the last two years haven't had great records, but they're seriously going in opposite directions in this early season. Absolutely. Who do you like for the national title this year? Man, Texas looks good. Now, uh, again, they smoked Michigan, but but I knew they were going to smoke Michigan. Nothing against Michigan. Michigan lost a ton of players, and they they are fresh off a national championship. It's okay if they have a down year, and and they're probably they're they're going to. I like Texas. I like Georgia, uh, and I like Ohio State. I think it's those three, and then there is a bit of a drop off. Mike, I have to one last one. Please uh, forgive me here. Um, I thought of you, and this is why I wanted you on. And I know you're not going to throw dirt on the guy, but when I saw Brian Kelly and that dumbass post press conference <laughs> is when he was blaming the players and everyone and why they're this and why they're that, it reminded me of his first couple of years in Notre Dame when they had to finally have a conversation with yeah. him because he was so so screaming at the players, he was using vulgar language on the sidelines. They told him to pipe down a little yeah. bit and his behavior, and there was on display again um, with the LSU kids. I mean, if you don't like something that's going on on the sidelines, that's a you thing. That's his program. Doesn't yeah. he control that? 
Oh, yeah. Yeah, he controls that, and he controls, and he has to control himself. He had uh, a bad year, a four and eight year at Notre Dame when, you know, they thought maybe he would be gone, and he decided to become more of the CEO and hands off the offense and kind of let the coordinators run the deal, and he, and he was did less yelling uh, at the players. He had kind of turned a corner there, and they were making uh, the, the playoffs. I think they made him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, w- without question, and – you know, it, it's it's who he is. He'll he'll revert back to it when when things are going poorly, and they certainly went poorly for you uh, against USC. Mike, how can folks find you? Uh, go Joe and Golick. I'm doing a show with my son, eight to ten uh, Eastern in the morning on all the DraftKings networks, which goes out to all the streaming services that I don't understand. Somebody asked me in an interview, they're like, "What's it like now in the podcast streaming world?" I said. Ain't no different for me. I talk into a microphone and then it gets distributed somewhere where it gets distributed. I don't know, Uh, but I'm not, I don't change what I say into the microphone, but it goes all over the place and all these streaming services. But yeah, doing the show with my son and doing Westwood one uh, Sunday night games. I'll tell you what, that's that. My daughter reminded me like, you know, why that I'm an old man still, because I got bombarded the other day on my Twitch channel and she told, and I'm like, I got bombarded. I blocked the guy. She goes, dad, my friends called and said, you're such a dope. The guy, Austin Eckler's trying to help you. He's blowing up your channel. You don't know what being bombarded is. I go, no. She goes, God, read a book. My friends say you're such an old man. And so I'm still learning, Mike, you know, I, I don't I'm learning this new business here. Well, we both have gray in our beard, so that that kind of is a telltale sign of where we are. <laughs> Absolutely. Mike, thank you so much, my friend. Thank you so much for all the time. You got it, Dan. You got it. That is the great Mike Gullick. Absolutely. Make sure you check out his show. It's pretty cool that him and his son get an opportunity to work together. I love that. You know, anytime that, you know, Mike could set up a situation where he can bring his son along like that. Pretty good stuff there, man. I really appreciate that. Guys, please hit the like button. Hey, I got rated. That's it, CW. It was rated, not bombarded. It was rated. Okay? It was rated. My, 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 daughter, my daughter, she came downstairs. I told you guys this, I think, the other day. And uh, she goes, Dad, that's a good thing. And I was like, what do you mean? She's like, I, it was like 15,000 people were on this channel, this Twitch thing. It's CW. <laughs> hey, it was like 15,000 people and Austin Eckler's in it. Dan, I'm trying to, I'm trying to help you here. And I'm going like, what do you, what, what, what do you mean? What's, what's being rated? And I'm like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and Austin Eckler goes, I'm going to, I'm trying to get him on this program. Hey. James Jones, I'm trying to get Austin Eckler on the program for you. Okay. I'm 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 trying to do my best to get him on the program. Okay. Um, Miss Mike and Mike, that was a really great show. I, I don't really like uh Greenberg as a personality. I love Mike Gullick. Good show today, Sills. Have a good night. Thank you, JM. I appreciate it. Hey, hey, Xander, JM, great show. <laughs> um. <laughs> Sills, great show. <laughs> and then this guy writes a beatitude about me. <laughs> Senor goes, Sills can open that mouth pretty wide. That's how you get a bunch of cannolis in there, Junior. What do you think I'm doing here, guy? Only reason I know sometimes watch a game or stream and he raids the channel. Yeah, that that's how I learned it, too. I totally did. All right. Great stuff, guys. Really appreciate it. By the way, I thought it was really weird I was defending the Eagles today against Mark Holmes. I, I don't know what it was. It was, like, weird. And I know some of you saw that, and it was kind of weird for you, too, because it was weird for me. Hit the like button. Thank you guys a lot. Big Joe, Xander, can't thank you guys enough. Two to six, Eastern time. I know. I mean, it was really weird, man. (laughs) You are the greatest defender of the Eagles I have ever seen. That's 
Till tomorrow. <laughs> 2 to 6 Eastern. We'll see you on the flip side.